Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to the last in a series of seven market briefings we're running prior to our hybrid ATE in June to up update you all on the various market situations around the world and, of course, any relevant trade partner information around ATE. Uh, my name's Lee Sorensen uh, from the industry team here at Tourism Australia in Sydney. Really pleased to be able to bring you uh, this afternoon our Japan and South Korea briefing. I'll be getting us started here uh, today and then facilitating some question and answers through the course of the presentations. Before we begin, though, in the spirit of reconciliation, Tourism Australia acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Uh, first up this afternoon, you'll hear from our country manager for Japan, Derek Baines, who will give us an overview of the Japanese market situation. Derek is then going to have a discussion with Jason Brereton, who's the managing director of Oceania region for one of our leading Japanese travel partners, HIS. There is then the opportunity for a little question and answer session after that. Then we're going to move over to South Korea and our account director there, Jin Ha Jo, will be giving us an overview of the South Korean market situation. Jin Ha will then also have an invited guest discussion with Jun Shin, who is the chief strategy officer at leading travel company Tide Square. We'll then also have some uh, question and answer following that session and bring everyone else back on board uh, if you've got any other questions that uh, you might want to ask. So just a bit of general housekeeping around all this before I hand over to Derek. Uh, this session will be recorded and available at a later date on the registration site. A link will also be sent to you. Copies of the presentation, uh, the presentations will also be available and forwarded to you. So you'll be able to get those via a PDF. Uh, one of the things I would ask everyone watching is please submit your questions with the Q&A option at the bottom of the screen. We have had some questions come in in advance and I will um, ask some of those, but um, uh, as we go through, if questions come to mind, please type them in as you think of them uh, at the bottom of the screen there, and then we can try to address those in the Q&A. Uh, we'll also send you out a survey as part of our uh, follow-up to this, and if you could give us some feedback about what you'd like to hear about in future briefings and what you thought of this one, that'd be fantastic. But on that note, I'm now going to hand over to Derek, who will get things underway. Thanks, Derek. Thank you very much, Lee. It's uh, great to be here with everybody today, and uh, we really appreciate the opportunity, Tourism Australia, to, uh, to update the Australian suppliers on the latest information that, uh, that we have. And also joining me today here in Tokyo is our Partnership Marketing Executive, Yuri Kinoshita, who many of you will know, um, who leads our trade activities here in Japan. Um, and as Lee mentioned, in a few minutes, we'll be joined by Jason Brereton. Again, many of you would know Jason, the Managing Director of HIS in the Oceania region. Now, I'll just go on to the first slide and see how we go. Good, good. So system's working fine. To start with, I wanted to run you through at a really high level the key activities that Tourism Australia and more broadly the STOs here in market are engaged in to help suppliers as we move towards the recovery. TA is leading very strong demand building activity in Japan throughout the pandemic. And we'll touch on this a bit further across the areas of consumer marketing, trade-focused activity, which Yuri-san leads, and PR. Connecting suppliers and buyers directly in a number of ways. Many of you participated in the Japan Marketplace online uh, in February, a couple of months ago, time's flying. And of course, ATE is coming up in June, um, only a few weeks away now. And we look forward to uh, working in a hybrid way this year for ATE. We'll have a lot of the Japanese buyers here in Tokyo, um, mainly in one venue, we hope, and connecting, of course, to suppliers in Australia. A lot of research and insights work is uh, underway and is part of our ongoing, ongoing series here at TA. We'll touch on some of the latest research, which I must say is, is actually uh, painting quite an optimistic picture for Australia once the borders do open in due course. Trade education, for example, many of you will have participated in the Japan host program that uh, we developed with ATEC 
over the last few months and a very valuable program for those who were able to participate. Working closely with the STOs and the RTOs to optimise our joint efforts. The Aussie Specialist Program, which has had great successes here in the last few months, even in the online environment where many of the Aussie specialists are either stood down or working part time. And the National Experience Content Initiative, something that uh, we hope many of you will be able to participate in working with your RTOs to bring new content through the various marketing channels that uh, TA has and the STOs also have. And last but not least, we're working behind the scenes right now on an integrated campaign to relaunch Australia in the Japanese market and in most of the uh, key markets around the world as soon as borders can reopen. Just to go into some of the research to set the scene, um, in February, we were in market with our latest round of consumer, consumer demand research. And as you will see here, if you can see my cursor moving, first we look at consideration. So are consumers considering Australia as a destination? Well, absolutely they are. And we're, only num we're number two only behind Hawaii in the consideration set. The other key markets that Japanese consumers are considering include Italy, mainland USA, France and Singapore. The next is intention. Yes, well, we're considering, but are we actually intending to go to this destination within the next two years? Again, Australia is ranking really well. And look at the trend over the last four years. We were at number six in 2017 moving steadily and strongly back up to number two position. So at a very high level, I think this augurs extremely well for Australia when the borders do reopen. Now I'm just trying to find the, uh, the button here, which is a bit elusive, here we go. This is a fairly busy slide. And as Lee mentioned, all of these will be available for participants to view at your leisure. So I won't go into the detail, but it supports very much the uh, good news that we just saw on the previous slide. This one looks at our HVT, so the high value travelers who are traditionally our key target market. And this tracks six different themes which are all really important in people's choice of destination. Good food and wine, we're ranking number three of all destinations now and moving up quite rapidly. This is a very, very important factor for destination choice and it augurs well for us. World-class nature, we're out and above at number one. Safety and security, really, really important always, but particularly in the post-COVID environment, we believe that it will be a critical factor going up and at number one. World-class aquatic and coastal, again at number one. The gap's narrowing a little bit there, but still out in front. History and heritage. Now, traditionally, this is not an area that we rank really strongly in, in terms of surveys, despite the fact that we have um, many great experiences for people to enjoy. It is an increasing trend, however, and I think with more focus on, on our historical experiences, particularly Indigenous experiences, we can hope to enjoy a further increase there. And family friendliness, another really important one, I think particularly post-COVID, We've come out in front and an increasing trend. I'll touch on a couple of these uh, data points and, and let you ponder the others uh, at your leisure. What I would say is, in general terms, there's increasing consumer confidence in Japan. 
This, of course, does not relate specifically to travel. It's overall consumer confidence, but it's it's the underlying uh, desire to to spend money in the economy, increasing and recovering, but still under a hundred. One hundred is the the neutral mark. So there's a long way to go before uh, consumer confidence neutralizes, but the trend is certainly improving. Travel intention is still in the single digit figures. So that obviously represents the fact that COVID is still a major problem, borders are closed, et cetera, et cetera. And roughly half of the respondents to our surveys uh, say that they feel it's safe to travel to Australia at this, at this point. And I think that goes up and down depending on the news, but generally um, a, a very encouraging trend. I'll just focus in on one of these slides, at, uh, one of these factors at the moment. Top left, 62% of respondents aren't thinking about their next holiday right now. So we are still very much in the position here where people are not actively considering or planning. They are certainly thinking and dreaming and um, considering where they might go in due course. But at this stage, we still have quite a long way to go before we can convert the awareness and consideration into actual bookings. Quick update on COVID. Um, Japan is experiencing, unfortunately, another increase in new infections, which you can see here. It bottomed out uh, at the beginning of March, but has since unfortunately increased on the back of new variants and um, restrictions that were removed for a period of time. We're now going to go back into a period of so-called state of emergency. We believe that will be announced later today and will cover the Osaka and Tokyo areas over the golden week period. What does that mean? It will mean domestic travel will be discouraged. Uh, there'll be restrictions on restaurants and bars, probably uh, to the point where they will not be able to serve alcohol at all during this period. So for Japan, a relatively strict uh, period of restrictions is expected. The vaccination program has begun uh, using the Pfizer vaccine. At this stage, though, only about 1% of the population uh, has been vaccinated. So early days yet. Feedback we're getting from our key distribution partners and some other relevant uh, themes that uh, you may all find of interest. In terms of leisure travel, which is our bread and butter, I guess, in most cases, um, for those people who do travel out of Japan at the moment, very, very, very few people are traveling, but they are subject to uh, quarantine on the way back. In most cases, it's home quarantine, but still it's a, a quarantine of sorts. Some destinations have product on sale. There's limited product on sale for Hawaii, but a very, very slow take up at this point and the air capacity to most destinations is, is very, very limited. Many of our KDPs, as the Australian industry is also experiencing, have had to restructure. Many of them uh, are significantly restructuring, slimming down and rationalising their organisations. The number of destinations and permutations and combinations of um, uh, tour products has been reduced and the individual planners who put these um, packages together are covering more and more destinations. Many of them though are staying connected with customers using virtual tours and there's some great innovative um, work being done with virtual tours. Student market, a lot of interest still from organizers and schools to to send students and um, wanting to make sure that 
at the Australian end, there's still uh, a warm welcome expected and um, the on-ground arrangements will be as per, uh, as per previous years. On distribution, the number of retail shops will decrease over time. Uh, most of the large KDPs have announced programs to reduce the number of shops by up to half over the next few years. Certainly there'll be less reliance on printed brochures, although I don't think they'll become extinct. Um, in all cases, there'll, there'll be fewer of them and they'll probably be thinner than before. And with that territory comes more digital distribution and marketing, which of course has opportunities attached to it as well. Air capacity, as most people would know, um, there is still a air corridor operating between the two countries and ANA is at five per week. JAL's currently at three per week and uh, um, that changes a little month to month, but essentially JAL and ANA are continuing a reasonable operation. And of course, Qantas and Jetstar uh, have said that they will commence operations at the end of October if they can do so, and, and they're currently open for, for bookings. Lastly, on this point, Japan domestic travel, uh, the go-to campaign, which had a very significant multi-billion dollar budget, is currently suspended in the context of, of trying to keep people home. Um, it's unclear if and when that campaign will resume. Um, as of a few weeks ago, we were hearing that it might start up again in around June, but um, we'll have to wait and see there, depending on the uh, results of the, the new restrictions. We're pretty short on time today, so I'll just touch on this very, very quickly. I thought it might be interesting for those attending today to see some of the, the trends that are emerging in the market. And this is across the economy, but of course, many of them are very relevant for tourism in particular as well. And these are trends that have been identified by the Nikkei, which is the leading business newspaper in Japan. In marketing terms, sustainable development goals, SDGs, a very, very big trend, a buzzword at the moment. The tourism industry in particular is very keen to look at products and services through this lens and are actively pushing SDGs as, a, as an aspect in marketing. Um, so to, to focus on products and experiences that respect the environment, that, that allow people to interact with the environment in a sustainable way, and a very, very important trend that um, is beginning to permeate so many industries here. Personalization, of course, direct to consumer is a marketing buzzword. And for those who are um, engaged in digital marketing, which is most of us these days, um, the third party cookies will be disappearing in the next year or two. And how do we all um, beef up our own web presences to, uh, to collect data that otherwise we might uh, have been getting through third parties? Consumers are talking about workations, sustainable, going back to the SDGs. They're talking about ethical, they're talking about personalization as well. Cashless payments. Uh, taking more and more of a, a prominent role in, in the payment world as cash has become uh, less popular, particularly during COVID, people don't wanna be handling cash if they can avoid it. Active seniors, sharing services and mobility as a service. So these ones, particularly um, in terms of tourism, the, the use of shared rental vehicles um, is, is something that will probably come to be more important over time. What I will do is just end my particular presentation on this slide. There's a lot more detail coming through and, and one more slide that I want to talk about. 
um, please have a look at the, the detailed slides uh, at your leisure because they do give a lot more information on these specific activities. But if we look at the, um, the key areas of consumer marketing and PR, and then our distribution activities, through the various phases that we expect, the earlier phase where we had the pandemic declared and, and lockdowns in Australia and in many countries, rising optimism phase where we are right now, and free movement uh, when borders do reopen. So across the board, you'll see here, and for those who've attended our sessions before, some of this might be familiar, um, across social, across digital and PR, a comprehensive um, series of activities that we're rolling out in conjunction with partners, in conjunction with our STO colleagues, and keeping Australia front of mind as a destination. Through this rising optimism phase here, uh, we've broadened the activities, particularly around content. TA has been working with the STOs and with the industry to develop some really strong content, unique content. And of course, our social media uh, success is in no small part due to the great content that's coming through from the trade, from you all, uh, and highlighting in new and innovative ways what kind of products and services you're offering. As we approach the time when the borders will reopen, and of course, we all want to know when that will be, we don't have that detail yet. Um, assuming there might be a bubble between Australia and Japan at some point, we have put a lot of work already into a integrated marketing campaign to be ready for that border reopening announcement. More detail will be, will be shared on that in coming months, but we have already made a lot of progress. We will be ready to go as soon as the borders reopen. On the distribution side, as I mentioned, there's a lot of change happening in our KDPs. Changes right from the top, um, changes in CEOs and right through the organizations, streamlining, slimlining, more focus on digital. And we're on the front foot with the new people and with digital integration programs working with the KDPs. So I will zoom through and let you look at this at your leisure. But before I hand over to Jason to uh, field any additional questions, some readiness tips from Tourism Australia here in Japan. And I'm sure that most of you in Australia in your roles have already made a lot of progress here. Um, there's nothing super surprising, but from my perspective, these are core things that um, while the borders are closed, we can do some work on together and contribute to a strong level of readiness when borders reopen. The first thing is COVID safe accreditation. Um, and one of the best ways for the inbound markets is to work through the ATEC um, accreditation process and, and the uh, related local authorities and listing on the ATEC tourism trade checklist. Connection with your ITOs and wholesalers, um, obviously critical and it's, it's the um, the key driver, of, of course, of success in the, the longer term. Please keep strong dialogue going with your ITO and they will guide you as to, to what information they need at what particular junctures going forward. Content and comms, uh, as we mentioned, the National Experience Content Initiative is a great, uh, a great initiative there, around $12 million budget and we're hoping that there'll be about 1,800 new content pieces developed across the 57 regions of Australia, um, which will be used in every channel we can possibly use, um, our own channels, your channels, and KDP channels. Let's make sure where we can that 
we have up to date Japanese language websites and comms material and listings on the ATDW. Please participate as today in the market briefings and for those buyers, uh, sorry, for those suppliers coming to uh, ATE in June, uh, an opportunity to co connect directly with them uh, during that event. And of course, talk to us about anything you need. Talk to your STO and your RTO. We're always here to help and uh, provide information and, and whatever support we can. So our guest today for the Japan section, very excited to have Jason with us. Jason is the Managing Director of uh, HIS in the Oceania region, known to many of you, I'm sure, and has a, a long and very strong uh, career with HIS and in the industry generally, uh, and uh, an MBA from Bond University along the way. I don't know where he had time to do that, but uh, he managed to fit that in as well. So uh, hi, Jason, and um, I will hand back initially to Lee to lead the uh, Q&A for Japan. Thank you. Oh, yes. Thanks. Um, thanks, Derek. Uh, we haven't really had any questions come in. We have one come in, which is more of a general question, which we might try and get to at the end of um, today's, um, when we finish both sessions, if we've got time to get to that one. So just some of the other ones that have come in earlier um, and some of the ones as, uh, as we've gone through that have come to mind. but. Question for you, Jason, is, um, you know, at the moment, what's the best way for Australian suppliers to engage with, you know, companies like yourself and what information are you really looking for? Okay. Um, Derek actually mentioned uh, a little bit earlier, uh, one of our concerns is whether a supplier will be able to provide uh, the pre-COVID service levels and those expectations of a Japanese traveller after the reopening of international borders. So um, really what we're really looking for is uh, suppliers might wish to share with ITOs what, what, where they are at, what's been happening, including how they are working in the domestic market and what has changed, what their practices have changed, uh, if they've had any um, um, changes in their products and that type of thing. Additionally, uh, working with AT, uh, ITOs uh, to produce um, online experiences. So the remote travel uh, is a big one. It's a great, chat, great way to engage. And we, we actually see future benefits as, uh, as the traveler will be the one who will make that decision uh, if they've seen something in a virtual uh, sense over another destination. Cool. Great. Um, next one. What, uh, what big changes, if any, do you envisage to the way Australia will be sold in Japan post pandemic? Um, it's definitely the, the brochures will be used less and less uh, as a selling tool uh, in-house, um, particularly as uh, storefronts are slimmed back and that type of thing. Uh, there will be the shift again towards the experience online prior to a purchase. Um, and this has really been heightened by the popularity that we've seen recently with online experiences uh, by ourselves and also our competitors. So I think it'll be a little bit of a mixture of the brochure, um, but also that online experience uh, and probably a li little bit more virtual uh, travel consulting and that type of thing with the consumer as well. Right. Thanks. Um, one that's come in, I might throw to you, Derek. I don't, I can't, Vernon in Cairns. I don't think we can answer this one for you, mate, but um, we'll try. Um, how likely are the JQ flights? I'm assuming you're talking about Cairns there, Vernon, um, uh, into Cairns uh, from the end of October. Any thoughts on that, Derek? Have, have, have Qantas Group given you any indication on any of this? Uh, at, at this stage, Lee and, and Vernon, of course, the, the Qantas Group is hopeful that the, uh, the current plan can be realised, that is to commence operations at the end of October for the northern winter season. That clearly will depend on uh, the environment in terms of vaccines, in terms of the, the border um, actually being opened uh, widely by that point. So um, I think we're all very much hoping that that plan can be realised, but um, at the same time, um, I'm sure the Qantas Group also realises that it's heavily dependent on, on a whole lot of factors. Um, and 
let's let's cross fingers that we can all develop rapidly and get a bubble in place. Um, I can't really speculate any further than that, other than to say, wouldn't that be great? Cool. Uh, maybe just one, I'm just looking at the time and I will hand over to uh, Jinha Joe in uh, South Korea pretty shortly. Maybe one more question for you, Jason. It's really that um, significance of um, Japanese speaking staff and collateral. Like how important in you know today is that um, to have Japanese speaking staff, Japanese language website, marking materials? Is it as critical as ever? Um, or not? Uh, in fact, it's probably more critical. Uh, it comes back earlier to uh, a few of Derek's slides uh, talking about the um, safety and peace of mind. Uh, so in Japanese, anzen, anshin. And that's the importance of that and continuing to be able to have access to uh, Japanese front, Japanese speaking frontline and sales support staff will be paramount for the destination Australia mm -hmm. within the Japanese markets. The perception of Australia and Japan as being a safe destination has been, you know, further magnified by how Australia has handled the pandemic so far. So it is a big thing that we really, uh, really, uh, uh, I know each each uh, supplier has to make their own business decisions. And, uh, but, you know, as Derek has mentioned earlier, when, uh, when the bubbles and, and that type of thing are opened up, you know, that we are ready for it because we don't want to lose out to other destinations that are going to be very much on the front foot, particularly um, ones like Singapore, who are going to be very aggressively in market up there in Japan. So we want to make sure that we're going to win it uh, first up, first um, time. Yeah, great. Um, some great insights there, um, both. So uh, thanks, Jason. Thanks, Derek. I, I might, we might jump over to South Korea, to Jinha now. Uh, and then we'll come back at the end. And if there's any other uh, questions that come up, we can uh, address those then. So, uh, hi, Jinha, and I'll over to you. Thanks, Lee. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Jinha Jo, based in Seoul, Korea. Very nice to meet everyone here before AT and today. I'm also with a special guest speaker, Mr. Shin from Tide Square, to give you more insight from the KDP's perspective for our market. But before hearing from him, let me give you a quick market update for 10 minutes and hand over to Mr. Shin. Not much change from last year's briefing. So uh, for those who already attended last year's session, it will be a refresher to understand how much potential um, the Korean market has. With that, um, some snapshots of uh, Korea. The land size of uh, South Korea is quite small. Australia is 77 times bigger than the uh, South Korea, but we have 50 million population. A good advantage we have is uh, we can focus on Seoul than the rest of other regions for any marketing programs. Almost every airlines, KDP's media, are all based in Seoul too. Um, some of the social issues Korea is facing are the country is rapidly becoming an aging society because more and more Koreans don't get married or have a child, leading to growing the population of single household. So many industry people ask me what's um, our main travel segment, but I should say all segments are important because um, traditionally families with kids are the main travel market, but the travel demand from singles, double markets, young explorers tra traveling along is um, uh, growing very fast as well. Okay, then let's move on to Korea's outbound travel market. In terms of traveling abroad, um, Koreans were very unfortunate because we, were, uh, we are neighboring with North Korea. So we Koreans were not allowed to travel to any of um, overseas uh, countries till 1989 for security reason. So the overseas travel restriction was lifted only um, 32 years ago. But since uh, 1989, our outbound travel market saw a double digit growth almost every year. And whenever a major crisis of the 9-11 or SARS hit the market, the travel demand was rebounded very fast. So when you see the uh, number in 2019, you can see that nearly 29 million of Koreans traveled abroad. This is a remarkable number as a country of 50 million population because this means nearly 60% of Koreans travel the year, a highest ratio per capita, proving Koreans are avid and resilient travelers. And among 29 million um, who traveled abroad, you might want to know where then Koreans travel. 
Uh, by the way, do you know how many international uh, airlines uh, we have in Korea? Including Korean Air and Asian Air and Jin Air, you might know we have 10 international airlines born in Korea. And eight of them are SECs. So when you see the uh, top 10 popular travel destinations, you can see that distance and aviation capacity matters the most as 80% of the entire outbound uh, travel market accounts for Asian countries with less than six hour flight time. And the USA is the only single country in the top 10 list as a long haul destination. Obviously, Australia is not there. So okay, then where will Australia stand for Korea? 280,000 Koreans visited Australia in 2019, 10th ranked but it means only 1% of Koreans chose Australia among 29 million who traveled abroad. So it sh still shows a huge potential to increase. The biggest hurdle in increasing the number of Korean visitors to Australia is limited air capacity. We had recently 21 uh, direct flights only between Korea and Australia pre-COVID, while um, there are more than 200 weekly flights between Korea and the USA, 10 times larger than the capacity we had for Australia. And Japan had also over 70 direct flights uh, weekly to Australia pre-COVID. So one of our priorities is to recover the aviation capacity back to normal and continue to seek airlift opportunities by working closely with airline partners. Now let's move on to the uh, COVID-19 update. Overall, Korea's situation is much better than um, many other markets uh, and the economy is quite robust and domestic travel is uh, surging uh, really well. And uh, many of you agree Koreans are known to be quite impatient and reckless. So we have bali bali nationality, which means the fast, fast culture. So now Koreans are really pent up, itching to travel abroad right now. But a big concern is though uh, numerous travel agencies will not be able to survive. 80% of employees in the travel and airline industry are in hibernation in Korea. And many of them might not be able to return to work even when the market's ready, which is uh, very tragic. However, I'm sure many of you agree that this can be an opportunity to create healthier and more sustainable environment in the travel industry. Because in the past, Koreans, um, Korean travel agencies and tour operators uh, just over compete each other undercutting uh, their margin and distributing really um, unattractive products mostly. So more solid and financially stable travel agencies will remain, will be more interested in developing quality products uh, for high value travelers. To share our vaccination rollout plan, we started our vaccination quite late um, and there is a possibility that there will be a delay of vaccination delivery uh, but uh, the Korean government still stick to um, the original plan to achieve the country's immunity by November. So let's see how it goes. And uh, we'll be able to share uh, more updates later on the, this year. Okay, then moving on to the new trends about uh, what COVID-19 uh, will bring to the uh, Korean market. Without any uh, doubt, safety will become the priority when it comes to selecting travel destination and Koreans look for um, open air, isolated destinations, beautiful nature, less densely populated destinations as well. So basically, we Australia uh, will have a great potential. This is also an interesting statistics. We Koreans heavily depend on TMAP when driving to look for a location or a route. And the team have released a report on uh, which locations have been most searched and least searched compared to the year before. And it clearly shows that Koreans avoid congested uh, indoor areas while visiting more um, attractions for outdoor activities, camping, hiking, golf, all of which uh, perfectly fit with what Australia can offer. Our recent um, um, CDP report also uh, shows that Koreans' uh, intention and consideration to travel to Australia is higher than ever, as Australia is now positioned as uh, one of the most desirable and the safest travel destinations um, among all com competitors. So with this uh, momentum and positive sentiment, our strategy and recovery plans are 
everything is unclear and no one knows when the borders will open. And with our limited budget and resources for Korea, instead of uh, investing our huge efforts um, for the brand campaign, we'll focus on creating and building demand and conversions while increasing visibility and awareness of Australia. Um, for that, some of the activities and programs we are undertaking are, we try to reach out to the uh, consumers to deliver the message that Australia is a perfect post-COVID holiday. So we feature our campaign contents through social media ads to keep them dreaming of uh, Australia. OZ Specialist Program is the area that uh, we've been very proactive. Like I said, most employees in the travel industry are on leave, but we keep engaging with our partners, providing latest information and increase their loyalty and product knowledge. So, so far we hosted 29 live webinars and for each time on average nearly 180 travel agencies attended, which is amazing. Other than that, um, we've been actively communicating with our partners via various online channels. And for many of our webinars, uh, we try to encourage our industry partners and sellers to get involved as much as possible. So thank you for those partners who already joined our webinars as a guest speaker to introduce uh, your products and uh, made our seminars more fun and interactive. Um, for distribution and airline partnership, to share a couple of key programs. I'm very excited. Uh, we are ready to take off um, Dream Flight to Australia campaign with one of uh, the airline partners in May. It's not a real flight to Australia, just a two hour long flight up in the sky, but the airline will offer three flights dedicated to Australia. So we'll decorate the airport uh, check-in and in-flight area with Australia themes uh, so the passengers can have a unique experience. But more importantly, we will fully utilize the airline's uh, online media channels, including the website and social media channels to feature our travel content to reach out to millions of their customers. Another exciting program we are working on is uh, Australia pre-sale and all the uh, booking campaign in June. For that, we are developing FIT to a product for high value travelers to showcase them through a TV home shopping TV channels and live commerce as well, together with a TQ and destination uh, Gold Coast who share the budget. So we expect extensive media coverage as well as substantial number of bookings will be generated. Um, and the product doesn't include fl flight this time, but we plan to launch um, package product uh, with flight when the airlines are ready to offer airfares uh, later this year. Okay, the last page, uh, last not but least, uh, many programs are lined up uh, that we can engage with our industry partners. Um, first, we support ATEC to organize, um, to organize the Korea host program for industry partners uh, in Australia, so they can have a better understanding of uh, the Korean market and to be ready to welcome more Korean visitors once the border is open. And right after that, the ATE will be held I think this year's AT is, is more important uh, because we can learn which buyers uh, have been survived and interested in selling Australia, even during this pandemic and what plans they have as well. And lastly, ASP Global Summit will be held in June as well. Um, and we expect thousands of buyers globally, including from Korea and Japan will join the event. So we have a lot in our plates, yep. Um, that's all from me, and now I'd like to hand over our guest speaker, Mr. Shin. Mr. Shin joined Thai Square three years ago after working for McKinsey and other marketing consulting firms, but he already established a broad network and in-depth knowledge in the travel industry. Um, so I should say he's known uh, to be the smartest guy in the travel industry in Korea. And Thai Square is the fastest growing travel agency. So Mr. Shin, we'd like to hear more from you about your company, your insights and what future plans uh, look like um, to prepare the post-COVID era. <laughs> Over to you. Oh, thank you so much for a nice uh, intro, Tina. Uh, everybody, uh, good afternoon. Uh, this is Jun Shin. Um, I'm, I'm the Chief Strategy Officer of Thai Square. 
uh, the leading uh, uh, OTA in Korea. Uh, for the last 10 minutes, I'm, I'm going to briefly introduce our company uh, to the audience and also uh, would love to uh, you know, discuss, uh, answer your uh, whatever questions you might have. Okay, uh, our company Tyscare is aspiring to be a number one online travel platform uh, in Korea. We are the only company uh, Kakao invested in, uh, in the travel industry. Uh, for some of you who may not know Kakao, it's Kakao Talk is basically uh, WeChat in China and Line in Japan, the messaging uh, platform almost all Koreans uh, population is uh, using. We're the uh, fastest growing uh, travel agency and with access to probably the largest number of uh, high value travelers uh, in Korea. As I mentioned, we're the uh, company, only company who got investment from Kakao and we have a relationship with a uh, leading uh, telco operator like SK Telecom and other uh, leading uh, companies in Korea. We're the uh, leading uh, travel tech company in Korea, uh, which I'm gonna uh, explain a little more in detail what advantage we uh, might have uh, to work with other uh, partners uh, in Korea and also outside in Korea. And lastly, we uh, could be uh, the best partner to work with in terms of uh, you know, using data and also uh, best partner to work with in terms of fast uh, execution. As I said, we have probably have the largest access to high value travelers in Korea. One of the vehicle is uh, our exclusive partnership with Hyundai car. Hyundai private travel uh, is the service we're running uh, in partnership with Hyundai car. Uh, Hyundai card has, you know, uh, the uh, premium card, uh, like black, purple, red. We have uh, access to those uh, uh, premium customer who are, uh, uh, in most cases, are active travelers. And uh, we also have, uh, uh, you know, benefit for those uh, Hyundai card users when they book, uh, you know, travel product with us. The, uh, the customers get uh, automatic discount on flights and hotel. And also uh, they can redeem their uh, card point and point with us. So basically, you know, the, we believe we own high value travelers in Korea with uh, Previa. And also with two new brands we launched even during pandemic. <laughs> uh, Kite is more of targeted towards uh, MZ generation, millennial customers. And Tuobis is more mass targeted, uh, targeted uh, a little bit older uh, in customer segment. Tyscare is also, uh, you know, the, probably one of the few companies, OTAs in Korea, who've been investing in travel startup very actively. One of the two services I'm gonna to highlight today is uh, one, uh, first one is uh, PlayWings. PlayWings is the only affiliate marketing platform in Korea. Uh, basically, you know, when customers, uh, you know, register their destination of interest, uh, when there's a deal, including flight, hotel, package tour, activity, day tour, whatever, when there's a good deal, we send notification to the customers and we uh, often work with uh, OTA to get booking. Also the great advantage to work with other partners, we send traffic to airlines, hotel chain directly and PlayWings will be uh, the only affiliate marketing uh, platform in Korea. And uh, pre-COVID uh, PlayWings is uh, was one of the top three 
you know, the mobile app in terms of uh, act, uh, mostly active users uh, behind Skyscanner in Korea. And Kite is a new, uh, you know, online travel product we launched targeted uh, toward millennial uh, customer. Uh, this is the product that will be integrated with Kakao. We are actively working closely uh, with Kakao to uh, introduce travel service, uh, tightly integrated with messaging platform, Kakao Talk. So I just wanted to highlight Kite, uh, which will be uh, the key uh, you know, building block for our uh, growth agenda. And in, uh, let me highlight two advantage we have in terms of technology. In, in the uh, flight uh, side, uh, we have developed the system uh, that can handle both uh, leading GDS, uh, both Amadeus and Sabre. And Tyscare is the only company who got level four NDC certification in Korea. We are the only company that commercialize NDC uh, service in Korea. Uh, we are currently connected to uh, Br uh, British Air, Lufthansa, Singapore Air, and also, uh, and hopefully uh, when uh, Bodo reopen, we are, uh, we hope to work with Qantas uh, in NDC as well. We're also, we are the only company who got connected to all LCCs in Korea, uh, the uh, direct uh, connectivity. So we have access to largest, uh, you know, the flight, uh, you know, content, and we can uh, work with uh, various channel uh, to uh, sh uh, provide those content. Same in the hotel side, uh, we are connected to global OTAs and also global hotel chains uh, like Accord, uh, IHG, and also we are connected to uh, major uh, channel managers like Sideminder and uh, Sana in Korea and Tia Lincoln in Japan. So we are uh, we we are ready to access largest uh, hotel uh, you know inventory, and the same thing we can uh, provide this uh, hotel content to various channel, uh, not just for our channel and. Uh, also to other uh, partners as well. And uh, when I had a discussion, pre-discussion with Jinha and uh, uh, something really uh, remind me. Uh, so we, uh, let me uh, like to share some collaboration uh, case we did in 2019 with Catalonia Tourism Board in Spain. Uh, one of the key uh, issues we, we are uh, we were trying to tackle was back then is how we can motivate Korean travelers beyond Bar Barcelona. Most of Korean uh, you know travelers go to uh, you know visit Barcelona, but they uh, after two or three days in the city they tend to move to uh, Madrid or Sevilla or other parts of Spain. Uh, rather than you know staying in Catalonia, visiting other uh, beautiful cities in Catalonia like uh, Girona and others, so we actually uh, work together how to build awareness uh, about other destination in Catalonia uh, state, and also how we can uh, educate our customer to, uh, and show great. Uh, you know, history and the older, you know, the heritage of uh, cultural heritage about Catalonia. And we did, uh, you know, very extensive campaign together. First, uh, we targeted uh, high value travelers uh, in the previa uh, with the premium uh, hotel and activity options. So this is the actual uh, promotion example we executed, not just uh, you know selling uh, you know hotel product or activity option. We actually develop contents about Catalonia, about history and all the good things about Catalonia, including food, wine, 
And also we have a dedicated section for couple of, uh, you know, the destination uh, in Catalonia, like Girona. So we actively, uh, you know, showcase uh, what kind of great things uh, Catalonia can offer to our customers. And also we leverage two, uh, you know, the vehicle we have, uh, we leverage uh, play wings to uh, share these great content with the largest number of people in a short, very short period of time. Play wings uh, used to be uh, enjoying a lot of active users uh, pre-COVID. So we actually work closely with play wings. And also one of the uh, you know service uh, we are uh, you know we have invested in was uh, Oste, which is a locally developed uh, hotel meta search engine. So we also leverage uh, Oste to actively promote Catalonia. Lastly, we work closely with uh, Korean Economic Daily, one of the major uh, newspapers in Korea. We developed a special section on Catalonia, eight page uh, section, uh, totally exclusively dedicated for Catalonia region. Uh, so we, we could have uh, included all the detail we uh, couldn't uh, put in our uh, you know, online platform. We included uh, great things about uh, Catalonia, where, uh, how to get there, you know, what to enjoy there, all those. And also in the printed uh, material and also online so that uh, customers can look for after. So we uh, work closely uh, with Catalonia Tourism Board to uh, you know, to achieve one goal, how we can motivate Korean travelers, uh, not just Barcelona, beyond Barcelona to visit a uh, great uh, destination in Catalonia. Uh, as far as I understand, you know, the so far Korean uh, travelers mostly visit, uh, visited uh, Sydney area, but I, I do think we have a great potential uh, to motivate uh, Korean travelers to visit other great uh, destination in uh, Australia. And this is something we can work together to build awareness and to develop a product. And also along the way, there might be a lot of barriers for us to remove. And we are happy to work uh, together with, uh, you know, Travel Australia and also other uh, key partners to uh, do the same thing with uh, Australia. So here's uh, you know the introduction about uh, you know the Thai care and maybe you know the we can uh, probably I, I should stop and maybe uh, do a, a Q and A session. Okay, sorry. Um, Thanks everyone. Thanks, uh, Mr. Shin. Thanks, Jinha. That was um, <clears throat> that was great. Very informative. Um, we have had a couple of questions come in, so we will. I, I do realise we're sort of hitting up time now, so we will have a couple of these questions. And then for those of you who've answered, who've asked questions, if we if you don't see an answer, we will get those to our teams and we'll come back to you directly with an answer to those questions. But but perhaps one um, seeing we've just come off uh, Korea. Um, <clears throat> Maybe I don't know if uh, Jinha, you want to take this or you, Mr. Shin. Um, but what, one of the key travel segments from Korea has been the group package tours um, segment in the past. How, mm -hmm. you know, how do you predict the volume or number of these will change you know, post-COVID? Do we think this will th there'll be a shift? Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll go first. Oh, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Jinha, you go first. You go first. Yeah. <laughs> sure, sure. Um, I think those uh, group travelers um, following tour guides slide will disappear gradually. Um, for Koreans, uh, the travel funnel now is uh, instead of visiting uh, travel agencies' websites, consumers will go to neighbor Korea's Google to search the destination and uh, book the product. So um, the influence of OTA will be getting bigger um, as they will have a price competitiveness with a real-time uh, booking solution. So we expect only a few big players among traditional travel agencies will remain, especially those ones uh, 
who uh, equipped with a savvy uh, online infrastructure uh, yeah, and booking engine as well. Um, you can add more, Mr. Shin. Yeah, I, I agree. Uh, the demand for old style uh, group package tour will decline, uh, obviously. Uh, and, you know, the traditional, uh, you know, travel agencies has a, a, you know, have a daunting task to redefine uh, group package in the post uh, COVID uh, world. Mostly small, uh, you know, small size, uh, you know, tour but how, we, how they can do, how they can develop, operate those uh, small tours in a, at a scale so that they, uh, they can make a, a profit. That will be a key challenge. Uh, global OTA will have a much bigger influence because obviously uh, with Deep Pocket, they, they also have improved uh, uh, their core space significantly with uh, downsizing and everything. So once the border reopened, they're ready to pour a lot of money into advertising and marketing. And that's something uh, personally I've been um, worrying about and we are uh, actually preparing uh, for that scenario as well. Right. Um, perhaps another one for, for you both. Um, you touched on this, Mr. Shin, in terms of talking about some of the great work you'd done in Catalonia and you talked mm -hmm. about Sydney and certainly, yeah, for Korean travellers in Australia, we do, um, we have found in the yeah, pre-pandemic that mm -hmm. they are quite narrowly focused on where they travel around Australia and Sydney's, you know, um, a big attraction, obviously, but how, how do you both think that we can, or do you think that will continue in the future, that sort of trend, or how do we um, disperse Korean travellers more around Australia? Any thoughts on that, Jin or Mr. Shin? Oh, yeah, um, I think the uh, that maybe I'll I'll go first. Uh, I think that will change definitely in a post-COVID world. You know, Australia is uh, you know famous for almost Corona uh, COVID three uh, nation, so we should uh, absolutely leverage that reputation. And also the you know the demand uh, consumer demand will change. They will look for more or less populated areas and beach resort type rather than the, uh, going into the uh, city. So I think definitely we, we, we might have great opportunity to uh, motivate uh, Korean traveler to visit other great area in Australia. And also maybe, you know, uh, if Qantas uh, resume uh, direct flight uh, between Korea and Australia, and that might be uh, helpful uh, as well. And also the one thing I really highlight uh, with uh, our Australian partner, it will be one of the key barriers uh, back in, uh, you know, before COVID were, was transfer uh, between, because Australia is obviously a big country compared to Korea. So uh, domestic uh, flight within uh, Australia and also uh, car transfer, uh, was uh, were a pretty big challenge, even for uh, myself, who can speak English and who, who can, uh, you know, uh, wander around whatever I want. But I think something we need to, uh, you know, the problem solve together to, uh, you know, uh, found the sol find the solution uh, for our customers. Sure. Uh, for me, the biggest reason why the market share of Sydney is much bigger for the Korean market, I think, is obviously the aviation capacity. Um, among 21 direct flights, uh, 14 are to Sydney. Um, another reason I think is the visibility. When you search travel contents for Australia, there are more contents for Sydney than other states or region. Um, also limited knowledge for travel agencies and tour operators uh, is a big hurdle as well. Whenever I uh, meet travel agencies, it's really surprising to know how little they know about beyond Sydney. So that's why we put every effort in training for all states and territories to help d diversify uh, the products. And as uh, June mentioned, COVID-19 will be a game changer. There will be growing consumer demand and need to travel to less than reasons uh, for open air and outdoor activities. So we'll push KDPs to develop more various products together with STOs as well as uh, airline partners like Singapore Airlines and Cathay who have a great connectivity um, to those beyond Sydney destinations. 
um, we also plan to organize uh, more families uh, for Korean buyers to increase hands-on experience and destination knowledge. Uh, for that, I think uh, we should uh, really work together with uh, STOs and LTOs and uh, with our industry partners as well. Great. Uh, thanks both. Um, Jason, might uh, throw back to you now with a, a question when we didn't get to a little earlier, earlier you or Derek or, or both. Um, you know, do we think that Japanese travelers and relates sort of to the conversation we we're just having then about Korea, but do, do you think Japanese travelers will be looking for new experiences and product when they, when they travel to Australia in the future? Um, I, I can jump in really quickly. I'm really keen to hear Jason's view. Um, I think it's a mixture of both. Um, as the years go on, um, the markets are looking for new experiences all the time anyway. But I think the fundamentals that we offer in Australia, and to Jason's point of Anshin Anzen, the safety and peace of mind related experiences and destinations within the country that can offer that, I think they will really ground us and, and help us recover the, the market. But absolutely, I think, particularly with the recent trends with SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals and the focus on sustainability, I think that theme is really one that will resonate with markets. It is resonating right now and um, suppliers who can offer more in that regard or explain in a new way, their existing offerings um, will will benefit. Right, and, and Jason, from your perspective, uh, from my side, um, it's probably uh, in the initial will be very much the travel style will change. Uh, so, um, in some of Derek's uh, slides, there was the mention of the workations, uh, the longer the longer stay, the social travel, so um, private tours. Uh, there will probably be that expectation of, of higher um, service levels, uh, in particular um, increased uh, touch times between um, the local ITO and the, and the uh, traveller on the ground. So uh, initially, as Derek mentioned, the, um, the, the safety and the peace of mind is going to be uh, paramount. But then afterwards, uh, once uh, we see a little bit more stability, uh, with, uh, with borders not opening and closing and that type of thing, then uh, those newer experiences will start to, uh, start to dictate how we uh, put our product together. Fantastic. Um, one of the questions we have come in, Jason, perhaps you know, one for you, you know, and or Derek, but um, is, and I'll just read it out here, assuming that a travel bubble with Japan will soon occur, in order to appeal to tourists more than other countries such as Singapore, I think it is necessary to review cancellation policies, minimum passenger numbers, booking cutoffs, et cetera, at each product supplier so that consumers can make reservations with confidence throughout Australia. What do you think about this, Jason, as a travel agency um, perspective? Okay, um, it has it has actually been quite a, uh, a, a quite a difficult year um, dealing with uh, cancellations and um, rebookings and amendments and that type of thing. And I, I think probably one credit that has to be given is very much that uh, our uh, our carriers here in Australia they have introduced this um, you know book and and change and and that type of flexibility. Uh, there have been some suppliers that um, have clearly just said, no, there's no refund. And, and I do agree with uh, what Kondo-san said, that we do need that sort of flexibility so that uh, consumers do have that uh, peace, again, that peace of mind that it can be held in credit, it can be used in the future, and it's not just a straight cancellation. You know, like we are going to have to have a, it's going to be a long battle against a lot of our other um, uh, competitors, uh, particularly, as I said earlier, Singapore, uh, they're going to be very, very flexible on how they, uh, how they do that. So it's really going to have to be a full industry 
um, from TA, STO, RTOs, all the way through to suppliers, inbound tour operators, OTAs and everyone really working together to make sure that Australia is one of those destinations that's going to be a flexible one um, to be able to make a booking for. Comments. Um, maybe one more, just getting conscious that we're sort of 10 minutes over time. So related to that, but um, perhaps for you, Jinha or Mr. Shin, um, you know, with people going to ATE, whether it's, you know, um, Korean based um, ITOs here in Australia or for the virtual um, ATE, you know, what, what sort of information do you think um, they'll be looking for? you know, from suppliers? Is it about those sort of booking conditions and flexibility? Is it rates for next year? Or, yeah, what, is it new information? Like, Jinha, maybe to you? Sure. Um, well, in the past, we haven't seen uh, many Korean ITOs attending the AT because they used to distribute the same mundane products for decades. But this time, uh, many ITOs also feel that they need to change the products. So a dozen of Korean ITOs will attend AT Live in Sydney and also 30, more than 30 for AT Online. So if you attend our live events, it will be a very good opportunity to meet them in person and introduce your updated products and share plans and ideas about what kind of product to be launched and how to promote the, uh, uh, the products. And um, obviously, I think Koreans really like already going very fast to FIT and this pandemic will expedite uh, you know, the trend uh, even faster. So more and more Koreans uh, will purchase a lot of products like um, flight accommodation, attractions for separately. Um, so it's very critical uh, to work with our ITOs so that they can feature your product uh, on the KDP's uh, platform. Um, to increase the visibility and conversions as well. And uh, a lot of uh, small groups uh, for a, uh, high value travelers, they will look for um, golf, um, romance, wellness, glamping, and so on. So it's better to prepare ready-made multi-day uh, itineraries in advance. Uh, so maybe those are the things that ITOs and uh, um, travel agencies who attend AT will uh, expect. Anything from Mr. Shin? Oh, I, I agree, uh, definitely agree. And just uh, wanted to highlight uh, just one thing, you know, we all know traveling after COVID will be forever uh, changed. And, you know, the, this is the time of greatest uh, reset for travel industry. So uh, old mundane product will not be welcomed by our customers. So we really need to, uh, spend time and study what uh, consumers uh, will look for in the post, uh, you know, pandemic world. And we have to develop product, right product and deliver that to our customer. That's our job uh, in, you know, for everybody here in, in the seminar. Okay, fantastic. I know that there are still some and answer questions, but given we we're now sort of Hit about 15 minutes over. I want to say a few things. Just thank thank you for everyone for staying online, both the people um, who are watching this, but also our guests and my colleagues. Thanks for um, thanks for the really insightful presentations. Um, looking forward to talking to uh, you all more, both those online, but also my colleagues. Thanks, Jason. Thanks, Mr. Shin, for for being our guest speakers today. Um, Derek, I don't know if you've got anything else you want to say before we close or. I think we've run out of time, but if anybody has additional questions, happy to answer them offline, Lee. Yeah, uh, and I think that's, yeah, I know Jin Hao feel the same way. Uh, we're very contactable at the moment. So look, anyone watching, if you need to get in touch with us, um, if you don't have everyone's direct emails, contact me here in Sydney and we'll put you in touch with the markets. But on that note, we might uh, call an end to the uh, webinar. Thank you everyone for being involved. Uh, have a great weekend. Um, and look forward to uh, catching up again soon. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you all. Have a great Bye. weekend.